I, um, I grew up in South Texas, and uh, my family's been there since it was part of Mexico. And uh, everybody in my family has in some way been employed by the border. Uh, my family is, is in, you know, involved in business and commerce, and, uh, and also you know, parts of my members and my family were involved in drug trafficking. Uh, <laughs> Others were um, work for ICE, and C, uh, CIA, uh, police, and uh, others. My uncle was a coyote, a human trafficker, and now I'm a journalist, <laughs> <laughs> covering it. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, so I spent I've spent the last uh, many years looking at the landscape around where I grew up. And uh, when I was a kid, you know, some of my earliest memories were of migrants and encountering migrants crossing. I've lived in Mexico for about the last 10 years. And um, during that time, I, for some years, I was working as a photojournalist traveling to uh, Central America and other parts of the world. And I started to feel this disconnect with my homeland and where I grew up. And so uh, my grandmother had this old Polaroid camera. And so, and I found this stack of pictures, and so I started making pictures like she did of my family. And what I found is as I was going fishing with my dad and hunting, and uh, in the same weeks that I was there, I was also uh, photographing the types of atrocities that we see on the border. Things like this, where migrants who have tried to make their way into the United States cross the Rio Grande, and have gone far into the interior to avoid the checkpoints that exist uh, nearly 100 kilometers north of our border. To avoid those, they go deep into uh, the Texas Monte, and they often get lost and die. Um, and so when I was doing this reporting, I, uh, I was about maybe 20. I was on assignment for Michael Lucille, actually. He was the one that gave me my first break. Uh, working for the Washington Post. And I met this woman from Honduras who was uh, lost and um, very, very sick. And she told me that she had been traveling for quite a long time. And I was very much confused as to the, that reality, being like a young man in that world and seeing, OK, we're in the middle of nowhere on a ranch in Texas. It's like 105 degrees outside. This person is alone. And the desperation that that took was something I didn't comprehend from a privileged American standpoint. So I went to, to Central America. I, I worked in, in Honduras, covering sort of the push factors of political violence that were happening there. Um, things uh, like land loss and uh, property rights for African palm oil and you know, military uh, actions against gang members. And I made my way to Ciudad Juarez, uh, where I've spent probably most of my career working, uh, predominantly looking at the children of factory workers who manufacture goods for the US, things that we all buy here in this country and in other nations that export from there. But the problem is, in these communities, these border communities, people don't make enough money really to eat and to even uh, take care of their kids. So they end up on the street. And they became funneled into gangs. Uh, many of them who I met and knew have been murdered. And during that time, I was hearing stories from people who I loved and I cared about, people like this couple, Pollo, who's, uh, who I'm actually his uh, child's godfather. And I became very involved in situations where I was hearing things no longer as a journalist, but much more as a friend. And so. At the end of that, you know, I come back each trip and I have my stack of pictures and I'm processing all of this stuff. And I'm, I'm a young guy, I don't really, I didn't have a lot of experience as a journalist, but I also had all of these emotional questions about right and wrong. I grew up super Catholic and uh, my family, you know, had these, uh, because of its complex color and our characters of who were members of my family, I always had these doubts about what was right and wrong. <laughs> and I was a little mischievous. So anyway, so I started writing fiction. Uh, I come from a literature background. So I wrote this, my, my first book. It took me five years uh, with the help of people like Lisa Factor and Jeremy Ralph and uh, Danya Taymor. And I wrote this first novel. And I included 
documentary materials inside of the book with the intention of sort of reinforcing that narrative. And the fiction allowed me to include dialogues and pieces of conversation that I'd heard, and also stories that often were tragic, but that allowed me to attribute those stories to sometimes fictional characters. And that allowed me to tell those stories in a way that wasn't really safe sometimes for those people who I cared so much about. And fiction gave that photograph breath. But because I get bored, <laughs> uh, I, along the way I met Danya Tamor, um, and she and I worked together with the New York Theater Workshop, and we put together an installation representation of this work. Uh, Lisa Factor helped us to curate this piece and put it together. I mean, she's been mentoring me through this whole process. And uh, along with Hiko Reyes, we put together an installation and presentation of this at El Museo de, de Hijo de Aguisote in Mexico City where people could interact with the documentary materials, see things like my National Geographic magazine, uh, the notes from uh, some of the things that I had seen, and also click through the photographs. I built this sculpture that was based on the crosses that mothers leave behind for their uh, missing daughters. After interviewing for years many, many of these women, uh, recently, actually while I was reporting for the Geographic, I was uh, able to go to some of the first oil, oral testimonies in uh, Chihuahua State and in northern Mexico. And these led to the conviction of five members of the Azteca gang who were involved in human trafficking and murdering of these young women. Now, I spent three days in there, and I did make pictures. I was allowed to photograph. But at the end, the photographs did not in any way really represent the things that I had heard for all of these years. And so what I did was I, I made this sculpture out of neon, and then in behind it, I made the, the loops of the buses that take the factory workers uh, and Juarez to work. And then we got two actresses from Ciudad Juarez, one to play a reporter and one to play a fictionalized character uh, who has escaped from this setting. And she's explaining exactly the hardships that she's been through. Since working on that, I've, uh, I met David Pablos in Tijuana. Uh, he's a fantastic film director, for those of you who aren't familiar with his work. Uh, and he has guided me and helped me over the last year to really shape that narrative into something that we can use for cinema. And just in October, the rights to the story were uh, purchased by uh, Ina Payan's uh, company. And so hopefully in 2020, we'll be filming that fiction narrative about two young boys, one who grows up uh, in a family of, of, of gang members and Sicario Hitman and another who, uh, because of the circumstances of his life and sort of the outside pressures, he ends up committing violence. And the question then in lies, like which one is really morally correct and, and how do these things play out in a place without law and order? But as I was traveling uh, all of these places, I started to look at the border differently. And I realized that this line that we often think of as a community divided is actually a unique and common experience from east to west. You know, we have our own language of Spanglish, which uh, we love and adore. Uh, you know, there is uh, different types of music and all these kinds of things that we culturally share with these communities. But also the history of this place was very important. Um, things, and I felt like here as an American, it was really important for me to reflect back on our past. I think often, um, because our seat of power is in a place like Washington, we tend to be a European-facing nation. And we tend to look at those groups from you know, the Greeks and the British and all of these other empires. And now we have ourselves become a colonial empire. And I think that it's important to look back and remember things like this in Taos, where uh, hundreds of Puebloan people were bombarded by the US military in 1848, and things like this in the Las Vegas affair. After the Mexican-American War, there were still people fighting for their freedom in places like New Mexico. And this is the site where three New Mexican rebels were killed in their fight for independence of the border nation. Um, as I was there traveling too, I, I, I came across this phenomenon, which many of you may have seen, but where people come up to the border and they, to avoid the long lines and all of these sort of things that we have to deal with, communicate with one another through this fence. And sometimes they sit for hours, they bring their puppies, they hang out, and it's really this kind of beautiful symbolic representation to me of that, this community divided by a line, but connected communi like, through communication and through history. Uh, I, 
for my National Geographic Fellowship, I've also been photographing along the border wall, but also deep south into northern Mexico, as far south as into Chihuahua, uh, Monterrey, um, going far north into uh, parts of Texas and California, because there is a lot of symbolic representation of culture, things, and also a lot of history. Places like this, this young boy who's uh, from California in a community of Mexican-Americans that's been there since the 1800s. And going to things like this, uh, Father's Day Carnesada, which looks a lot like something that you might see where I grew up, but is in a rural part of Chihuahua. And also covering the continuing uh, flood of migrants who are escaping violence and landing uh, in our uh, ranches and lands around South Texas. Now, uh, I've been thinking more and more about what connects us. And one of the things that I've been interested in for a long time is, is drawing. And uh, I like working with ink. And I've been fascinated by textiles, and particularly bandanas. I and mean, anybody that knows me knows I have a crazy collection of bandanas. Um, they're super useful. You, know, you can like, put them up in the window when you're driving across the border, and you don't get sunburned. You, know, you can wear them around your neck. And so I drew these pictures to represent some of the things along the border. This is a, this is a lizard, a uh, horned-toed lizard from, uh, f that lives in the borderlands that's going extinct, guys. So it's any of you scientists out there that are working on this, I applaud you because I love them as kids. And if you look under your seats, you will all find nothing. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, next. Thank you, guys. All right. I'm going to make no false promises, but instead just welcome to the stage National Geographic grantee Tara Roberts. Hello. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to see you and feel the energy in the room. My work is all about roots and ancestors, so energy is really important to me. Thank you. I feel you. So what do I do? I follow dive with and tell stories about black scuba divers who are diving for slave shipwrecks around the world. Last year, I dove off the coast of Key West, or off of Florida. Um, I had a clipboard, a pencil, and a measuring tape. And I helped to map my very first shipwreck. And it was incredible. I still remember the, the coolness of the water, the absolute silence under the sea. And I remember as I was hovering over my section of the shipwreck, this feeling of peace, of thankfulness, a sense of coming home. I felt like I was a part of a fantasy story. So I want to invite you to take a trip back in time with me to Atlanta, Georgia, circa the late 1970s, early 80s. I was a kid then. Um, I grew up in an apartment complex with my mom. It was just the two of us. My mom was a teacher. She's a reading teacher. And I don't know how like, the universe matches parents and children, <laughs> but my mom was the perfect mom for me. I loved reading. I loved books. And my mom had access to books. She used to go to her reading conventions and conferences and come back with boxes and boxes of books. I remember reading some of those books late at night under the covers in my bed with a flashlight 
disappearing into other worlds. I was a huge fantasy book lover. Um, Madeline Lingle's A Wrinkle in Time series was my favorite series of all times. I used to yearn for Mrs. Who, Mrs. What's It, and Mrs. Witch to come tapping on my window and invite me to go out and help save the universe. I had a really big imagination. There were no limits. But as I grew older, I began to notice a few things. First, I noticed that there were very few girls in the books that I read who were actual heroes in their stories. And as I got even older, I began to notice that there were no black people in these books ever, like no black people whatsoever. I realized that the books that had black people in them were often focused on pain and tragedy. I used to read those books and come away feeling sad and angry. I think even as a kid, I understood that there was a prevailing narrative about black people in the world. And that narrative was seen through a really distorted lens, a lens that emphasized, almost to the exclusion of everything else, struggle, pain, and trauma. But two years ago, I happened to be visiting the African American, well, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History here in DC. And I got a taste of what that narrative could be, of how the stories of black people could be told almost like a song, with a refrain and a crescendo, with an ending that acknowledged the pain, but that moved beyond it. The museum tells the story of the 12.5, it's an estimated number, 12.5 million Africans who were enslaved and brought over to the Americas on approximately 35,000 ships. Of those 35,000 ships, 500 to 1,000 are estimated to have wrecked. And approximately, well, we don't know, but hundreds of thousands of African lives might have been lost in that voyage. A huge part of history is just missing. Because of those 500 to 1,000 ships, only a handful have been found today. And only one of those ships has been properly documented. But the museum also tells the story of a group of predominantly black scuba divers. They're part of a group called Diving with a Purpose, who decided to take up this mantle and to search for those missing slave ships. When I saw their exhibit, I, I was transported to a place of hope and possibility. I felt like these people had the potential to tell what's a painful part of African American history in a completely new way and to tell it from a loving perspective tell it from a perspective that allowed deep wounds to, to heal, that allowed the possibility of closure. So Diving with a Purpose today is a part of a larger collaboration of organizations um, called the Slave Rex Project. The Slave Rex Project is hosted by the African American Museum and George Washington University. And so the divers are now diving with historians and archaeologists. And they are looking for wrecks in Africa, in the Caribbean, and the Americas. I'd love to introduce you to a couple of 
those folks, and these are the people that I'm following. Oh, there you go. So this is Kamau. He's American. He's one of the lead divers. Um, he's a pilot, a retired engineer, and at age 64, he teaches power yoga. <laughs> this is Gisela. Gisela is Mozambican. She's also a diver. She speaks five languages, including Swedish and Italian, and she runs the swankiest hotel on Mozambique Island. This is Jay. Jay is American. He's um, a diver. He's a lead diver and a dive training coordinator. Jay is about 6'5". He weighs about 240 pounds. And he has a laugh, I swear, a laugh just like Popeye the Sailor Man. <laughs> Starts in the throat and then it just goes for miles. Here are Cesar and Celso. They are Mozambican. They're 26 years old, and they're best friends. They've, kn they've known each other since high school. And they are two of only three maritime archaeologists in all of Mozambique. This is Samira. I love her. Um, she is 18 years old. She just turned 18 in December. She's a diver, and she's super smart, and she plans to attend Harvard or Yale next year. These are just a few of the people that I'm following and telling stories about. And they are the new actors who I think just by their very presence, by being who they are, are shifting the narrative of who black people are in the world. So today, I feel like it's more than I feel like. I think I am a part of a fantasy novel. I'm a character now. <laughs> I get to dive off the coast of countries with white sand beaches. I get to wrestle with a dark history and help set it right. I'm helping to free the minds and hearts and souls of a people who've been grounded in pain and debilitating stereotypes. I'm helping to resurrect memories from the depths and finding valuable treasure in the form of stories and bringing that to the surface. I think about another little girl uh, somewhere in the future, and maybe she's reading a book late at night under the covers Maybe not with a flashlight, but maybe she's got her smartphone or the Google glasses or something. But she's able to imagine the feeling of the waters. She's able to feel the coolness on her skin. She's able to behold this enormous history that's buried in the sands, but this time, she knows the names of those ships. She knows the names of the people, not the slaves, but the people whose lives were lost. And maybe she falls in love just a little bit with some of the characters, including some of the black characters in the story. And maybe she is inspired by them so much that she actually yearns for them to come knocking at her window and to invite her to come save the world. Or maybe even better, this girl decides to swap out her pajamas and don a wetsuit and dive under the sea and become a part of the story. Because maybe innately, she knows that the, transform the transformative power of storytelling is grounded in the me and the we versus always in the he, the she, the they. That's me. <laughs> that's me again. And that's me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tara.
And now for our final talk in this panel, I'd like you to help me in welcoming Wale Oyajide to the stage. So I uh, overslept. I had to come wear my pajamas to this talk. Sorry. <laughs> if I may, I'd like to have you take a moment, picture a refugee. Hold on to this image. We'll come back to it. As tools of rhetoric, numbers can be useful things. To stir up his base, a politician might falsely declare that thousands of dangerous migrants are marching towards our border. Elsewhere, you might be informed that while there were upwards of 4,000 people walking towards the United States, the overwhelming majority of them were women, children, and men who were fleeing violence, persecution, and extreme economic hardship. Numbers can be useful tools as fear-mongering, tearing apart vulnerable families while making those who have less feel like outcasts. Numbers can also inform us about those who we've kept on the outskirts. What numbers will never do is explain why a mother would send her son alone across the desert, or why a father who cannot swim would climb into a raft while holding his infant child. What numbers cannot do, storytelling in its finest form can. But the way that a story is told is just as important as the story itself. It's good. For those of us who have the luxury of looking at the migration crises through the cold, distant lens of numbers in a headline. It's difficult for us to wrap our heads around the realities that many have. But these are realities for some, even if it's not the realities of their entire lives. We hear often about the migration crisis. We are told that many flee their homes, their loved ones, their doorways, travel for miles, to arrive in a place where they must tell their stories to people who speak a different tongue. We're told they must shirk the stigma of being seen as another simply because they worship, speak, eat, dance, taste, or love slightly differently than we do. We're told and we see images of children playing in refugee camps, attempting to find some semblance of normalcy while praying of being resettled in pastel colored bedrooms of their own. And we see images of lines of asylum seekers trailing from one border denial until the next. But we rarely see what can come afterwards. What becomes of those who arrive despite it all? Those who dare to dream, those who hear of an American dream despite what languages they speak those who become our neighbors. We hear rarely about the dreams of the children who wake, thank you for America. I'm fortunate to be here in front of you because of my collaborations with migrants, displaced people, and asylum seekers from across the globe. With my ongoing project after migration, I've spoken with individuals who've traveled, who've persevered, and who have transgressed and nevertheless persevered at the end. Using fashion design as culturally representative, using film, using portraiture, and using interviews with individuals who have been behind borders, over waters, and through deserts, we produce portraiture and imagery that works to dispel stereotypes and biases many of us hold against these individuals. And more importantly, these portraits are designed to instill a sense of pride amongst individuals who've seen themselves displayed too often as less than. And so these people who we refer to as migrants, as refugees, are never shown as weak. They're never shown as despondent. They're never shown as victims of their circumstances. Instead, they're shown as strong. They're shown as triumphant. They're shown as figures of pride despite it all. 
In short, they're shown as nuanced human beings who love and hope just as any of us do, just as any of us would hope to be seen regardless of our circumstances. Because none of us is comprised by our weakest, lowest, and harshest moments. All of us see beyond the clouds because that's how we get out of bed in the morning. There are, thankfully, numerous organizations, individuals, many of us in this room, who work in the area of supporting migrants and telling stories about migrants. Very often, many of us are so consumed by doing the hard and necessary and laudable work of saving lives that we neglect to do the careful and beautiful work of explaining why these lives are worthy of being saved. And so we get comfortable and we fall back on creating image after image that does little to draw people in, but instead pushes us away. Images of suffering, images of ongoing trauma, images of depression, images that make us feel numb because as viewers and as an audience, there's little we can do, little we think we can do to stem the tide. My approach is different. I think that while what others do may be honest and well-meaning, it's incomplete. Too often, we have a reductive approach to showing those who've suffered. We define them entirely as the scope of their difficult journeys without mentioning the beauty and the range of life that they experience. We forget to mention the joys, the bedtime stories on the trail, the hopes of beyond, the waiting warm bed that they will arrive in. We forget to remind them and us that they are human. And so with this work, if there's anything I'd offer you about the way I choose to approach stories, it's to always remember that regardless of wherever the frame is pointed, there is grace to be found. You just have to look long enough. My work seeks to place its participants at the forefront. Their narratives take the forefront of what we speak about because it's their voices. They tell me how they hope to be seen. They discuss their hopes, their dreams, their passions, what brings them across the waves, importantly, what they have to offer. They're not defined by being open hands that need help. They have things to bring, things to contribute. And I think that for us, it's important to realize that very easily, any of us could be any of them. Any of them could be any of us. Indeed, the separation is one of fate and randomness. And so I think if there's anything I'd ask you to do is to think about the idea that no matter where tragedy strikes at any of our addresses, wherever we are on the globe, the ability to have integrity, sophistication, grace, regality is something that travels with us wherever we seek to find refuge, wherever we seek to call home. And regardless of how high, how far, or how wide, we build border walls. They can never confine the beauty that lies within any of us. And so I think I would ask you guys again to take a moment to picture a refugee. Do you see someone who is beautiful? If not, perhaps you should stop and look again. Thank you. Thank you, Wale. And while we're waiting for these chairs to be set, I just want to thank our live stream audience, particularly the students who are at Syracuse and Ohio universities. We hope to see you here on stage in a few years and read your grant application soon. Um, but now, help me in welcoming Dominic, Tara, and Wale back to the stage. Well done. <laughs> I think the nerves are a little calmer. We're good? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when we were talking about this panel and what brought it together, there were so many themes that jump in my head. Um, one is you all cover stories of migration, forced or voluntary, um, recent or past. But the other thing you all do, I think, very uniquely is that you're not constrained to one form of storytelling. So I find it interesting that you all incorporate some form of movement 
and texture and flow in your stories as you're telling stories of movement. How do you decide what medium is best for the story you want to tell? Wally, you want to start? I think it's about what's most effective, and it's always a means to an end, in the end being facilitating human connection of some kind. And so for me, if it's a mural, if it's a cameo in, in a film, if it's a fashion collection, it's ultimately about the goal being how do we get people to look at each other as human beings and less so as an other or a stranger. And we all have different tastes. We enjoy different foods, different music. So it's really about connecting in different ways and just thinking about being effective towards the end. I, I feel like, well, I came, I mean, as many of, I'm sure, people in the audience that came into this as a documentary photojournalist, and my intention was to report. I, I think that because of the type of work I was doing and because it was taking a lot, long periods of time, I just didn't really feel like photography had the texture that I needed to, to tell those stories. And I think, I don't know, I, I, there's a problem sometimes with photographers. We have this inc inclination to, or insecurity to feel like a pho photograph has to be the whole thing. But like since the spawn of photography, it's been uh, associated with text in all kinds of different formats. So for me, it's just um, finding a way to, to represent the stories that I want to do and, you know, like for example, fiction might be the best way, or um, you know, audio or whatever. So, yeah, I um, I think stories decide for themselves what format they should be told in. Um, I'm a writer by trade, and so I started this project thinking I would write, and that was my plan, but. Um, when I recorded voices of a lot of these people and even voices of the sea, I've been realizing that there's an audio story to be told. And that wasn't something that I could have anticipated. But being out in the field, I think the story, it tells you where it wants to go. And if you're doing it right, you follow <laughs> what the story says. It's a writerly way of putting it. <laughs> So in your spare time, do, do you create art? What medium? What, what's the, what, 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 what do you like to do if you're not? Or, or is it one and the same? Yeah, I'm a tortured writer. Yeah. Like, I'm supposed to be writing, and I'm like, ah, I should be writing. But that's my medium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just live in constant anger. Yeah, but you know, I really do. Don't we all? <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I skateboard <laughs> horribly. <laughs> no, really, I, I like to draw a lot, and I think that um, drawing has informed like my photographs and everything. So that that's the thing. Yeah. I generally parent pretty badly. That's what I do for yeah. a living. Um, no, I think. <laughs> so I, I was once upon a time a musician, and once upon a time a lawyer. And people ask me, "Do you make, miss making music?" And the answer for me is always no, because if you're making a thing, anything, the art of making, or creating, or conceptualizing something is feeding your soul. And so it's really about just being active or thinking about being active and making something. And so it's not so much the form or the medium, it's the idea and the intention to make something. It's a beautiful way to say it. So you all have talked about involving yourselves in the storyline. You're not playing the role of an outside journalist looking in. Dom, you've talked about when you made that switch. Tara, did you consciously make that switch? Or how did that? happen? Well, I think with the story I'm telling, I am a part of it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's my history as well. So yeah, it's, it's also my story. And that's why I decided that I wanted to dive with the divers and not just follow them around you know, and stay on boats. I wanted to be in the waters with them. Um, there is something powerful about the, I tried to mention this in my talk earlier, but just there's something really powerful about telling a story from an I perspective and a me perspective and a we perspective. I think it makes you look for similarities among the folks that you're talking to. There's a way when you tell the he, she story, you, I'm, I'm, 
I'm talking this out loud, so I don't know if this is really true, but it seems like there's a way that you look for the differences, because you want to you sort of report on what's astounding, what stands out, but when you're in the Me We stories, you're, you're drawn to what's, what's similar. No. So I think when you're dealing with people who have spent so much time being on the outside and feeling like they don't belong, um, for me, that trust comes from showing that they are seen and they're understood. So there's a dialogue and there's an exchange. And it's not just tell me about your experience. It's, it's very much like, what is life like for you? And you find out, sadly, to su my surprise, how astute, intelligent, and talented these people are. It's just the sheer stigma of being referred to as a migrant or a refugee has nothing to do or no bearing whatsoever on the talent, the education level of people who come from across the water, the desert, the border, whatever. And so for me, it's really about allowing the connection to happen and letting them know that they are equals and they should feel that way. And so we give them equal space to tell stories. Wonderful. So we have a couple minutes. Um, I have so many questions, more questions for you all, but I won't be greedy. We'll open up to the audience. If there's one or two questions, we can slide in. So much better. Let me see. <laughs> Anyone? Right here. We'll go to Bill. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was interested in, uh, I assume you're probably going to, it's no longer the seminar, it's a storytelling symposium. There's been very little uh, done today addressing the marriage of words and pictures, a little bit now, here. But I would like to suggest that in the future, maybe we do a little more consideration of the power that you get from the, the really fine combination of the written word, I don't mean fine penmanship, but the really good writing and really fine photography. I know the most influential book in my very young career 55 years ago was Let Us Now Praise Famous Men with the elegant uh, writing of James A.G. in the beautiful format of Walker Evans. And I think uh, we t we're starting to touch on it here in the young woman in the brilliant red comes as a writer, and I really love to hear that. So I think just in, in the future, might want to start talking about that. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Any questions? Right here. Uh, and uh, the significance of the red that you're wearing is having to do with a lot of the people you photograph wearing red, and then also, yeah, could you that. touch okay. on the <laughs> significance or intention of your coat and the figures on the scarves, and is that any part yeah, of no, the story. So, so that's, um, I'm a designer as, as well, and I make art that's intended to be culturally representative. So clothing that makes people feel, to put it simply, good about themselves and proud of who they are. Um, if I walk into the Louvre or many wonderful museums around the world, I tend to not see myself, speaking generally, within the pantheon of, of excellence. And so it's a very direct way to use the standard of beauty to reflect people who look like I do. And so when you then take that conceptual layer and put it on top of people who are literally traveling into a world that is considered the standard and who are being injected into that world and making a name for themselves and being proud of who they are, it's basically a double meaning of announcing and integrating and being peaceful, but also being proud. So Dominic, why are do you want to respond to that with your bandanas? <laughs> Which you've promised us all now? <laughs> For Collaboration. <laughs> um, I think that, I don't know, I think for me, so I grew up in a, a Latino and Anglo family, okay, on the border, which is, you know, there's a lot of that. We're all mixed up. And um, I think there, it's funny because you know, my mom is like this San Judas. She loves San, Saint Jude, and she has candles all over the house and stuff. And and now in Mexico City, I live in a neighborhood where they do a parade like every week. It, you know, and they shoot off fireworks like way into the night, unfortunately. <laughs> and it's like this nice little connection that I have. And my mom's family's, you know, they're like Italian and German and Scottish. So it's like uh, I think, you know, she grew up in that area, and she grew up in South Texas. And I, I think it, it, it 
it, it's something, there's something connecting to all of that. And I think including myself into the story too, for me is a charge to, to other people and, and not just not just Anglos, because like quite frankly, the most racist people in my family are probably Latino. And that, that's conversations that I have to have with them constantly. And I try to put my work into that. And I think including myself and, and that has always been a way to try to connect even my own family sometimes. So the, the bandanas was just like a way to be like, look, we all, we all sort of, this is, let's celebrate this space that we're in. So, and it doesn't matter what, what, you know, and I hope the photographs represent that, but the border is a very diverse place. With people, it catches people from all over the world, people coming from Central America, people who have come from Asia, people who've come from, from Europe or whatever. You know, I met Syrian refugees on the border. It's a diverse net. And that's what makes it really magic. And so I think, but it's always connected to that physicality in the landscape. And that's for me what the bandanas were about. I mean, really, I mean, it's just something fun. You know? <laughs>